and people are open, they're uh, willing to, um, you know, hear the gospel, and uh, they are open to what God is doing. We're so thankful for the vision of outreach and evangelism that our pastors have taught us and the fellowship has uh, kept at for the last 50 years. And uh, we thank Pastor Mitchell and Pastor Greg for all that they have done, all that they have imparted to our lives. Amen and amen. Are there any other announcements, perhaps, before we take up our offering? Amen. So this is came down the uh, pike. Little news article. from a Wham 13. Bring it up, Lord. Rochester hotel worker previously convicted of bank fraud is charged in a new alleged scheme in Rochester, New York, a man previously convicted on a bank fraud incident is facing federal charges in connection with a new alleged scheme. Henry Williams, 54, has been charged with wire fraud, bank fraud, and aggravated identity theft. Prosecutors say while employed at the front desk of Holiday Inn, Williams used the point of sale machine to put money onto personal debts and credit cards excuse me, debit cards. They say he impersonated hotel managers moving and attempting to move hundreds of thousands of dollars. They say he tried to hide his actions by pretending to be a hotel employee and making false accusations against another worker. Williams is accused of defrauding the hotel and its banks of about 80, uh, excuse me, $850,000 in addition to allegedly making $780 in unauthorized charges related to the card of a customer that had been stolen from the location. The defendant was said to be on supervised release at the time, stemming from a 2016 bank fraud conviction. Amen. So the scriptures that we know by heart are that, you know, God is going to find you out. God will find out your sin. Amen. It's only a matter of time. It will be revealed. Amen. If you... Uh, are involved in some kind of wickedness or some scheme or some sin, it will be discovered sooner or later. And I want you to know that God keeps good books. I mean, if you're trying to, you know, steal from God, will a man rob God, Malachi said. Well, we can try to, but, amen, it will eventually catch up to us if we're not serving God Eventually, yes, but also if we're serving God, but we're not paying our tithes, amen, because a blessing will not come into your life unless you are faithful to God. And that is financially, when you pay your tithes and you pay your offerings also, that is above and beyond. Some people say that the tithe is too little. It's too small. 10% is really not a good uh, uh, amount of money to give to God. In your increase. I read another argument that said that uh, the tithe was only for the people who were uh, harvesting their crops or had a, a, a herd of animals. They were supposed to give 10% of that. But I discovered that Jacob himself made a vow to God. He said, uh, of everything that you give me, all that I have, I am going to tithe. Amen. So let's uh, be appreciative to God for what he's done and be, uh, be doing what we need to be doing, paying our tithes and offerings besides. Can I have our usher come forward to collect the offering? Amen. Some people give online. There's a link online if you want to give this morning or at a different time. You want to give by paying through your credit card or your debit card. And uh, God loves it, you're for not a grudge, you're not doing it, you're forced into it, you're like, oh, okay, here you go, here's some money, God. But with the right attitude, God blesses a cheerful giver. Amen. Can you bless the offering? Yeah. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to participate in what you're doing. 
we thank you that what you ask for is so, so small. We ask the Lord that you give us the grace to tie our time, our abilities, and everything about us. And do anything that we can that you ask for. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. God bless you for giving. out on the platform and behind the scenes. We do appreciate all that you do. Amen. And uh, when we read our scripture, we'll be uh, reading John 21, chapter uh, 21, verses 15 through 18. And this sermon is entitled, Never Too Far Gone. And this is the end, the last sermon that I'm writing of this series. And I want to end up uh, preaching this sermon with Peter in mind. This is all about Peter, and it was never too far gone for Peter. And then many times we look at our lives and we just think, man, I've screwed up so many times, and there's just no hope for me. We live in a very desperate society, a culture that gives up so easily. It doesn't have the wherewithal to push things through, to give up. In the time of struggle, they don't understand, uh, you know, think about the Great Depression and all the, uh, the, the things that your grandparents went through to survive, man, but they made it. And I want to preach this sermon called Never Too Far Gone with Peter in mind. John 21, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? Pointing to the disciples. And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said unto him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said unto him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said unto him, Tend my sheep. And he said unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said back to him, Jesus Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Assuredly, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. And when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So my first question for us is, what's it like to be grilled by God? What's it like to be drilled by Jesus? Because man, when God starts 
asking questions. You're like shaking in your boots, man. It's a moment of concern for you and I. When God starts to deal with us about certain issues and he's got his finger on our chest and maybe we're hearing something different in the sermon and we're becoming convicted and we're thinking, man, I've really blown it. Our need, firstly, is to understand that there is a useful purpose to failing. You and I need to fail. It's an effective teaching tool that shows us or shows the student that they really don't understand the lesson or they don't understand the information. From my years of teaching, we always discovered what the, te what the student really knew by asking questions or by uh, letting them play through a piece of music. We could see what their weaknesses were a certain area, perhaps it was scales, or it was arpeggios, or it was intonation, or it was the tone of their instrument, we could actually hear them fail, and they could realize the area of concern. There may be something that the student never learned fully, and it is imperative for them to learn it. They want to succeed. There's a process. There is uh, a progression from A to B. You can't learn uh, a D until you learn C. There's an order to things. And so failing gives us a useful purpose so we can identify where we are wrong. Our failures help us to realize that we have not attained a certain mastery. So what happens after the failure? First, the question asked is, do you have or do they have a desire to pick themselves up and pursue their goal again, even after they have missed the mark, even after they have fallen short? Is there something inside of you that wants you to proceed after the failure? If yes, then the student can certainly apply themselves to discover, A, what went wrong, what was the reason for their failure, and where they need to go now. What's the next step? And secondly, why they are missing a specific element in the process. You have to ask the questions, ask the hard questions to determine what's gonna happen after the failure. The key element for success is to submit yourself, submit your will to the learning. Make it your goal, even after failure, to get up and learn and pursue and overcome. If you esteem the results, you see the end product, then you're gonna be willing to uh, pay the price to get that end product, whatever it is. You can endure the suffering. If it is a musical instrument, then they will begin to practice their scales or practice their arpeggios. They will surrender time and energy to make sure that the information is learned in the future. But there must be a desire to pick yourself up. Many times failure just it zaps the life out of you. It sucks the energy uh, and your determination begins to wither. You have to have something inside of you to help you to get past the failure, amen, and fulfill your destiny. Secondly, being used of God brings joy and dominion. Some of you may be happy where you are right now. This is all you want. This is fine. This is acceptable. And that's good for you, maybe. You maybe just like coming to church or hearing the preaching or clapping your song, hands and singing the songs. Thirdly, most everybody loves the fellowship. They love to go out to eat. They love the, 
the, you know, the, the gathering and playing games and, um, you know, sitting around a fire or, you know, eating a pizza together. They love the fellowship. They can get along with people. They love parties and gatherings. And there may be a few of us here who like all of that. And they see the importance of that, but there is so much more to serving God than that. To fulfill your ministry, to fulfill God's plan in your life, your destiny is the personal best of God in your life. Being used of God means you want to surrender your life to God. Man, this is a great need. If you want, you can go for it, man, and don't let anything stand in the way. God has created you for a greater purpose to do something than the average Christian. You may have dreams or desires, perhaps, to be used of God. Maybe you want to be a woman of God. You want to be a virtuous woman. You want to be able to work and make things and be able to help people and to serve. You want to have these things, these attributes in your life. Those are good qualities to desire. Maybe you want to be a man of God. Maybe you want to serve the church. Maybe you want to be in a ministry. Maybe you want to uh, be in a band or make music or be in a drama team or just get involved. In, maybe you want to be a pastor one day. Maybe you want to preach. And these are all good things. God has obviously put these things in your heart for a reason and a purpose. There's a purpose for your being born. And you will never really know until you lay your life down and pick up your cross and discover what God has planned for you. Being used by God includes five things that I came up with. One is being a pillar in the house of God, and that is first and foremost to be faithful to church or faithful to outreach. Amen. Becoming a soul winner is number two. Winning souls to Christ or bringing people to church, inviting them from your job, your neighborhood, your school, your business. Amen. Number three, apparently God has given you vision, visions, amen, of becoming an effective disciple, maybe an armor bearer for your pastor, or maybe a prayer warrior for your church. Number four, you may be called to ministry or maybe even preaching. And lastly, just to be used by God as a pastor or an evangelist. Amen. These are good things that God can use us to do in our lives. Amen. Let's secondly look at the demise. And that is that you in here that are listening to the sermon or maybe online, you have great potential in your life. There's incredible things that are before you, amen, but there's also intense weaknesses that you possess right now. And every last say is called to greatness, but it is a long learning road to attain. We're going to look at the life of Peter and uh, his weaknesses. Maybe you can draw some meaning and apply it to your very own life. God wants you to succeed. And we want you to succeed, but we have to address some issues that may be what's standing in the way of you fulfilling your destiny. We need to address some of the reasons. Why is it so hard to learn? How come we go through this thing over and over again? We're missing something. And Peter misspoke often. His propensity was to put his uh, size 11 boot or sandal, whatever he was wearing, into his mouth. He misspoke often. And I'm going to come right now at this point to his defense and start off this way by saying that Peter was the only disciple who confessed to Christ. Who do men say that I am, boys? And nobody really, you know, they had these great ideas. You know, Elijah, you're just a preacher, you're a prophet, you're a great teacher. And 
Peter stood up and said, you are the Christ. He was the only one. Now let's look at, uh, that was the exception to his uh, testimony was that, uh, you know, usually Peter was speaking things that were against God or out of place. Scripture teaches us that we need to be slow to speak in Proverbs. Slow to speak and quick to forgive and quick to listen, but slow to speak. Many of us don't have a filter on our mouths. We just say the next thing that comes out. This can be very dangerous and destructive. We hear something that somebody says, and immediately our first response is vomit. We say something that comes out of our mouth. It's offensive. It's so off base. Why didn't you think it through a little bit? Without concern for the outcomes. Usually it feels good because you're just not thinking and it just comes out and it's just, it just seems so perfect. Maybe like you were in a movie, I'm not sure. Amen. James 1.19. It says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool, when he doesn't talk, he holds his peace, is counted wise. And that shuts his lips, is a man of uh, understanding. But we think that those people are wise, but when he opens his mouth, all doubt is removed. Has anybody heard the phrase, to bite your tongue? Amen. It sounds kind of painful. That would be a great uh, image to put up here, somebody biting their tongue off. But it's so helpful and so healthy to not say the first thing that comes to your mind. And we see Peter here demonstrating this. In a minute, I'll give you a couple of uh, examples. Ephesians 4, 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying. That means building up people that it may minister grace unto the hearers. I guess <clears throat> the opposite would be to tear things down. It's so easy to complain about things, about somebody you can see their faults. It's so obvious. It doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to explain that and to expose those things. But you know, it's so easy to complain what's not happening or to put people down. It's so much more of a craft and an art to speak words that encourage and edify people and uh, promote the plan of God. Let's study here in Matthew 16. An example of how Peter misspoke. Uh, verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the first, uh, excuse me, raised on the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this should ever happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter. He said, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, man. You savor not the things of God, but the things of men. Many times we speak against what God is doing. It may not appear to be right. It may not appear to make sense. But, but it's God. It's totally God. And you're there giving your information, your you know real special viewpoint to, uh, or your uh, opinion of things. And it's not God at all. You, are, you become an offense to what God wants to do. So we hear Peter. Peter is... 
you know, and one verse he's saying, you know, Jesus, you're the Christ. And then he falls from, from uh, favor right there. And he says, no, God, you don't need to go to the cross. Don't, Jesus, you don't have to die for our sins. No way, Lord. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus replies. Many of you argue with God about doing something. And God wants you to do something in particular, and you're just fighting him. You're coming against him. You are opposing him. You do not favor or savor the things of heaven. We need to learn how to put Jesus first in all our agenda. If Jesus was going to die on the cross, Peter didn't like that story. He didn't like that and. He wanted to, uh, everything to turn out good. He wanted everything to be nice. And in the future, he didn't want to have to die like Jesus. He didn't want to have to sacrifice himself. He didn't want to have to surrender and follow Jesus' example. So he said, no, we don't want to do that, Jesus. That's a bad idea. Here's another example. I will never leave you, he said. Hmm. That sounds like a nice promise. Peter swears to Jesus. <laughs> and then the rooster crows. Two times. Luke twenty-two fifty-four. 54. Then they seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him. This man was also with Jesus. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You are one of them. He said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted saying, certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. How many times have you had an opportunity to witness to somebody and you said, nope, I'm not talking about Jesus. Uh oh how many times were you inclined by the Holy Spirit to do something and you said, yeah, not into it. Not feeling it right now, Lord. Or God gives you an opportunity to witness to somebody and you do not tell them about the way of salvation. Now, maybe you've never denied being a Christian. They didn't hold a gun to you. Are you a Christian? No, that's never happened. But have you ever made it your testimony to reveal who you really are? Have you told your boss who you are? I remember sitting down with the principal at School 39 in her office and giving my entire testimony from beginning to end, the one that you always hear. Have you shared with people on your job or people uh, that are friends in your school maybe or people, acquaintances and uh, relatives, have you, when was the last time you told them about Jesus? When did you speak? Sometimes it's not speaking things and maybe not speaking things. The act of uh, omission instead of commission. Have you begun to evangelize like you ought to evangelize? Have you been speaking out the gospel? Some of you might be embarrassed to invite one of your friends to church or somebody from work, a co-worker. Amen. Secondly, our weakness is that we are carnal. We're not willing to pray when Jesus tells us to pray. He tells the disciples, wait here, stay you know, they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he needs them desperately at this time. He's suffering great drops of blood. Are the, the, uh, the, 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 he's, he's sweating. There's um, great drops of blood that are dripping from his face, from his brow. Because he's about to be murdered. 
He asks them to pray. Peter is one of those whose self-discipline is missing. He doesn't want to pray. He's going to go to sleep. He's going to take a nap. He falls asleep while Jesus is praying all by himself in the garden. Just before Judas comes with the soldiers to arrest Jesus. Matthew 26, 40. Jesus came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me for this one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time he went away. Jesus prayed. And he said, oh, Father, take this cup away from me. I don't want to drink it. Nevertheless, let your will be done. And Jesus came and found them asleep again. For their eyes were heavy. Verse 44, so he left them. He went away again, prayed a third time, saying the words, then Jesus came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So many times we fall short of what God wants us to do because we're lazy, or we don't think it's important for us to read our Bible or pray or come to church because the pastor has prepared a sermon for you. And many times, people become so fallen, so far gone, that they feel like that there's no way that they can ever get it straight. Peter still doesn't understand it, and he's there, and the soldiers show up, and he pulls out a knife, and he cuts off the ear of the servant, and Jesus, you know, rebukes him again. John 18, verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, smote the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath, the cup which my father has given me. Shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captains and the officers took Jesus and bound him. So we are carnal many times. We're we're quick to do things that are not really what God's plan is for us. We're carnal, we're fleshly, and we say things that are wrong and we do things that are inappropriate. And lastly, his weakness was just giving up. Peter says, nah, Jesus is dead now, I go fishing. We read about this in John 21. Peter has given up waiting on God. He's given up. He, he's had uh, uh, misconceptions about what was about to happen. He didn't think Jesus should die. He didn't see the plan of Jesus rising from the dead. Simon Peter uh, said unto the other disciples, I go fishing. They said unto him, we will go with you also. You see, your testimony speaks volumes. And you are of great influence to other people by the things that you choose to do with your life. And then other people might follow you off a cliff. They go fishing with him. They went forth and entered into a ship and they fished all night and they caught nothing. Peter's asking, man, did I get this right? Was I disillusioned? Did I miss God? What about all the promises that Jesus made, Peter? Peter's wondering, man, I'm supposed to be the rock, man. I thought that God was going to build his church upon my confession. What about all that stuff? Peter is like, and you're in the same place sometimes. You're looking at the things around, you're like, man, is this what's supposed to be happening? It's easy at this point to give up. Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, 
the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. I say unto you, you are Peter, and on this rock, this confession, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you, Peter, the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He charged the disciples that they should tell no man that he was the Christ. So Peter had promises, man, God, Jesus was going to give me a key that I can unlock things that are bound. What about those promises that God has given you? And then you feel like God has just left you. Amen. Let's close this morning with the restoration of Peter. Because for Peter, he was never too far gone. There was always hope. Amen. And Jesus, amen, had made those great promises to him not to torment him, not to rip him off. Peter was the first man to see the empty tomb. He was with John and Mary. They saw that Jesus was no longer there. That was the first sign that Jesus was going to reveal things. He was going to rise from the dead. You think that might have stirred his faith a little bit. And then we have the drama that's played out on the beach. They're fishing, and uh, they see a man on the beach. They can't recognize him. And uh, he yells out, Hey, friends, have you caught anything yet? They're like, We've been fishing all night. Does this sound familiar? And uh, Jesus is on the beach. He personally has an encounter with Peter. It's in front of everybody. And there's no way you're going to make your comeback unless you personally meet with Jesus. And he talks to you. Do you really love me, Peter? Then fulfill my will in your life. Amen. We find here that Peter is restored on the beach to all those promises that Jesus had made to him. He becomes forgiven for, you know, denying him before the little the servant girl and through the, the people who are uh, gathering around the fire and he betrayed. And he denied that he even knew Jesus. And Jesus offers a return to Peter and a fulfillment of his destiny that was promised. Which leads where? It leads to the book of Acts. In revival there, he preaches on the day of Pentecost. And 3,000 people get saved. That would have never happened if he didn't get restored. Launched into destiny. As then there's the call to lead. Perhaps God has called you to lead also, just like Peter. Peter was called to lead, but it seemed like he failed miserably. You may be here listening, and you may think that you don't have what it takes. You may also be thinking, I'm too far gone. I've failed way too many times. There's something about me that I just... I give up. Peter understands about starting over. He writes in his uh, gospel, in his uh, letter, 1 Peter 1, 23, he talks about being born again. Being born again is uh, having a second chance, a new lease on life where you can start over. Being born again, Peter writes, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Here, Peter describes a chance to start over. Why can he preach about it? Why can he talk about it? Why does he teach in his epistle? Because it happened to him. First-hand experience. 
After failure, there is restoration. After restoration, there is destiny. If you can take, amen, the correction, if you can take uh, uh, the, the humility, you will be exalted, amen, in due time. But you must be humble. Humble yourself. First Peter also writes in chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. For you and I, if we can realize our failures and realize God's nature to restore us, amen, then we can have a, a second chance, then we can be restored, then we can rise up, amen, we can address our issues, repent of our sin, uh, and correct some of our weaknesses, perhaps, and uh, be set up for destiny when we realize that you and I are never too far gone. Amen. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. Amen. With no one looking around. And this is beginning for those who are not saved. Amen. You've never been saved before. But you understand that God gives you an opportunity, even though you failed miserably in life, that you can start over. It's called being born again. You'll find it in John uh, 3. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, man. Who hasn't failed in here, man? Who hasn't made bad choices? Who hasn't lived carnally? And you've never become a Christian. You've been an atheist. And you're, you don't believe God. Or an agnostic. There might be a God. But I'm here to tell you there is a God who wants to restore your life and bring fruit and destiny to you. But you have to understand that you're a sinner and that your sins have blocked God's favor from your life. You can't have Jesus and a lifestyle of sin. You can't be living in sin. You can't be pursuing sin. So I want to encourage you to understand that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He shed his perfect blood and he is here if you're listening online or you feel God drawing you out of your own life, your own sin, into the kingdom of heaven. You can be saved. Amen. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There has to be a blood sacrifice and Jesus successfully died on that cross He hung there and they drove a spear in his side blood and water came out he was completely dead and put in a borrowed grave amen and rose on the third day to give you that power and that recognition that there is new life you can start your life over and I want to pray with you if you're listening online or maybe you're backslid. Pray with me. Jesus, I come before you broken and lost and living in failure. I know you have a plan for my life. I thank you for dying on the cross and shedding your blood to pay for my sins. I repent of all my choices. And I'm asking you right now to forgive me and uh, restore me. I thank you for this prayer. I thank you for a new life. I thank you for restoration. And I thank you for my destiny. Come inside my heart and take over my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, whether backslidden or you've never known Jesus before and his forgiveness, and you sense hope in your life, you sense that there is a possibility that you can grow and get past the failures, and you can start your life over, and I want you to contact us or just come to church. We'll be back in church uh, 
uh, on Sunday night and Wednesday night, amen, located behind Buffalo Wild Wings. Let God get a hold of your life. Let God restore your dreams. And all his promises are good. He's a faithful God. Let's go ahead and uh, open up these altars for those who want to pray and believe God for a change. We're going to sing this song with our brother. Amen. Amen, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Thank you for uh, coming faithfully. Amen. The Lord bless you. We're going to go ahead and close it down. We'll be back tonight at 5.30 for prayer and uh, 6.30 for our evening service. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for restoration. Sawyer, can you pray over us as we go? Lord, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your patience and your reaching out into our lives every single day. It's traveling mercies as we go in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Lord bless you. Hallelujah.